today. I don't think there's a single manufacturer that doesn't use a, a CAN bus in their car. Um, but it's not just just cars. It's it's been used in all kinds of places: medical equipment, e-bikes, trucks, ships, um, and there's even right now a CAN bus uh, orbiting Mars. Welcome, everyone, to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm sitting with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and guest of our show today. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well. Thank you, Nate. Um, Our guest today is Ken Tyndall. He is the Chief Technology Officer at Canis, C-A-N-I-S, Canis Automotive Labs. He's going to be talking about hacking the CAN bus. And the CAN bus is the communication system that is used almost universally inside of automobiles. All right, then without further ado, here's your conversation with Ken. Hello, Ken, and welcome to the show. Um, Before we start, can I ask you to uh, say a few words uh, about your background and about the good work that you're doing at Canis Automotive Labs? Hi, yes. Uh, my name is Dr. Ken Tindall, and uh, I've been working in automotive uh, since the mid-90s. Um, uh, I co-founded uh, a company to do real-time embedded software um, that was ended up being sold to, to Bosch. And uh, since then, I've been working on um, um, Canis Automotive Labs, and we focus on security of uh, the CAN bus uh, inside vehicles. Can you say a few words? What is the CAN bus? Who uses it? Where do they use it? Um, so, so CAN bus uh, is, uh, I think it was created in the mid '80s. Uh, it's a it's a field bus that's for real time distributed control systems. It was created by Bosch for the car industry, uh, and today I don't think there's a single manufacturer that doesn't use a, a CAN bus in their car. Um, but it's not just uh, uh, just cars. It's it's been used in all kinds of places: uh, medical equipment, e bikes, uh, trucks, uh, ships, um, and there's even right now a CAN bus uh, orbiting Mars. Uh, so it's, it's a very ubiquitous protocol. Okay, and we're going to be talking about CAN bus in automobiles. Um, before we dive into you know CAN bus in automobiles and and you know some of the issues with it, um, can you introduce the physical process? I mean, what does automation in a modern car look like? I mean, you know, there must be a CPU or three involved. What what's being automated? How is the wiring run? What what's it like? automating uh, an automobile oh yeah that's a, that's a big question um okay so uh there's a lot of cpus in in cars more than just uh, so but basically there are i think it's called uh, electronic control units they're the the main boxes that control things so abs is one engine management uh, stuff like that um and then there are lots and lots of other uh, cpus that uh, are uh, you know little tiny processors that are sitting and talking on very low speed communication to those ECUs. Uh, so probably most cars have got more than 100, 200, 300 CPUs. Uh, in terms of the the main control units, uh, you're looking at 20, 30, 40, maybe even 100 uh, electronic control units in the car. Uh, and they're all uh, connected together, usually over multiple CAN buses, uh, because there are so many of these control systems. And they run pretty much everything. There's um, uh, Each ECU will be connected to a bunch of sensors, and then uh, uh, and a bunch of actuators, and uh, you may take sensor readings from across the CAN bus uh, to implement some application uh, that then then uh, controls local actuators. So a good example of this is the door modules that have control of the wing mirrors. So when you put your car into uh, into reverse, the um, uh, the transmission control systems handling all the uh, the gearbox. When it goes into reverse, it sends a message on the CAN bus saying what the gear is. And then the door module pick up that message, see that you've gone into reverse, and uh, can then alter the wing mirrors to, to point down to the back of the car uh, to help you re- reverse. So uh, it's a basically it's a very very big distributed hard real time control system. One of today's topic is a hack. You found somebody who'd hacked the CAN bus. Um, can you take us into what you found and you know say a few words about? about why the hack worked how is a can bus normally protected how did how did this attack get around those protections this hack has been uh, been going on for for several years it turns out um that uh, somebody made um un- understood uh, and reverse engineered uh, in the in the specific case we're looking at uh, at uh, toyota's uh, vehicles 
and uh, they made a box that when you plug it into the uh, the specific CAN bus, it uh, it fires off messages and messes with the bus so that uh, the engine management system thinks the um, immobilizer has been disabled by the key, even though there's no key uh, anywhere near it. Uh, and then uh, um, then another set of messages uh, will um, open the doors, and the doors uh, control system thinks, uh, yep, the key has told me to open the doors, and it opens the doors again, even though there's no key in it around. And then they uh, they just drive off with the car. <laughs> so um, it's, it's less of an attack, I would suppose, in a security sense it is, but um, it's a theft it's a, a device that somebody worked out how to, to attack the can bus and then packaged it up um and then started selling it to thieves all over the world i mean that's horrible um how did you come across this i mean how did did you find one of these on the black market how did you stumble across this <laughs> so uh a friend of mine ian table is a cybersecurity uh, researcher for, for automotive in fact and uh his his car was uh, stolen and uh I thought at first it was a uh, it was a trophy hack by someone uh, trying to make a point against the, uh, the cybersecurity research community, uh, but actually it was just a, a, a random theft um, that is so frequent that eventually it was going to come across someone like that, um, and so he did um, he did a lot of uh, detective legwork to 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 try and work out uh, what they'd done, and eventually um, uh, worked out that they'd uh, broken into the uh, the car through the through the headlights. And they'd used a theft device, um, and uh, with some of his contacts, he was able to to find out the uh, uh, the theft device specifically and uh, and who sold it. Uh, and then he bought one of those, uh, very expensive too, and uh, and called me in to uh, to help reverse engineer uh, the electronics and the uh, and the software and the way the uh, uh, it hacks the CAN bus to uh, to steal the car. Wow! So you know this thing is is participating in the CAN bus. You said it. It got in through a headlight. Is every part of the, the do you need the headlight on the CAN bus? Do you need every part of the car? I mean, why is there a CAN bus running out to the headlight? Why is there not just power running out to the headlight? Yeah, because uh, our uh, headlights have not been um, on off lights for oh, probably 30, 40 years. Uh, so, so the headlights have got multiple light bulbs and they dip and they have uh, full beam. Um, lots of modern ones uh, have motors that steer the headlights as you're going into a corner. Um, then there's uh, diagnostics. So, so if your um, headlight lamp has failed, uh, uh, the car knows this and can, can tell you as a driver that you're driving around with, with a broken headlight. Um, and then modern, uh, really modern headlights have, uh, are actually LED based with a grid of, of LEDs and, uh, they're sent commands uh, from uh, another unit in the car that's got a camera looking out to see where oncoming vehicles and, and uh, pedestrians might be. And then the beam is altered by changing this uh, this matrix of LEDs to, to not dazzle oncoming motorists. So headlights today are not, are not you know, a lamp with a switch. They are uh, extremely complicated uh, systems. Um, and because they are also sitting, uh, taking power, um, part of the power management of the car, you've got to be very careful the way you use the battery. Uh, so when you turn the engine over, um, an enormous drain is taken off the car battery. So one of the most common features uh, of CAN is to say, uh, I'm just about to turn the engine over. Everyone um, reduce your power consumption as much as possible. Um, and then they all go into low power mode. The engine is cranked and then the, uh, they all come back up uh, and wake up again. Um, so, so can, <laughs> yeah, headlights, headlights are complicated things now. And, uh, that's why they're, they're talking digitally to the rest of the car. And fundamentally this, 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 this applies across the whole car. Uh, so many functions are now talking to each other. I gave the example of the, the wing mirror, uh, and the, the, the transmission gearbox talking to each other. Uh, and this is why can, uh, came in, into being in the first place is, um, in the old days, um, if you wanted to do that wing mirror function, you'd run a, a piece of copper wire from the transmission box to the each door module um, so that the electronics in the door would, would move the wing mirrors. Um, and then there will be a wire for almost every every signal. And uh, uh, in the early days of CAN, I saw some charts from uh, from Volvo with their projections of number of wires needed and the growth in the functionality of the car. Uh, and they they worked out that uh, by, by the turn of the century then, um, their cars would be almost solid copper um, because of all the wires. So clearly something had to give. And either you can just give up trying to, to, to make any functions in cars or you have to find a different solution. And so the CAN bus came along as a way of um, um, 
grouping all of these wires and then replacing them with a digital wire. Uh, and in fact, in the early days, it was called multiplex. So CAN, CAN bus was a was a multiplex solution, and you had car departments called multiplex departments. And that's what CAN does: is it uh, it goes around and it uh, one wire is used to to provide all of the uh, the information exchange that uh, used to be done with uh, with separate wires. So instead of there being massive bundles of of, uh, of cables everywhere, which are not just heavy and expensive. There are also all the things that break. You know, they fall, you know, the ends fall off, and the connectors uh, break out, and the cables snap, and so on. So cars were going to become even less reliable as, as these functions grew. So CAN was a way of uh, reducing cost and increasing uh, the reliability, and so that's why it goes everywhere across the vehicle, from every single place where there's a sensor to every single place where there's a motor or some kind of um, some kind of actuator. Andrew, I follow that, you know, you can't have hundreds of thousands of wires running throughout the whole car until it becomes totally unwieldy. But it also sounds like we're making things very complicated by having so many CPUs. So what exactly is the the thing that reduces all the need for wires that makes things less complex here? Uh, well, I'm, you know, I'm reading a little bit into what, what Ken said, but, you know, in, in my understanding of sort of automation generally... Um, his extreme example was if every signal that has to pass from any part of the car to any other part of the car is done over a separate wire, if you've got, you know, a thousand uh, um, sensors, you know, monitoring stuff and actuators, you might have a thousand squared wires. That's the worst case. I think a uh, perhaps a more realistic example would be, well, why can't we put just one computer in the car? in you know the uh, the engine compartment and run all of the thousand sensors and controls into that computer and have that computer uh you know sense what's going on and send signals to the rest of the car saying turn the, you know turn these lights on activate that motor in the in the uh, uh the the mirrors um and i think the answer is that even if you did that, that would reduce the the wiring, but it, you know, not enough. So take sort of the the example of the light bulb that that Ken worked. He said, "Look, it's not a light bulb; it's it's LEDs. Maybe you know, I'm making these numbers up, but let's say it's 75 LEDs, and you need to control the LEDs. You know, you turn on different LEDs when you're cornering, cornering versus when you're you're not actually moving the light with a, a little motor. You're just turning on different LEDs in the bank of LEDs so that the light." you know, points in the direction you need it to point. Well, if you've got 75 LEDs, in the worst case, you've got 75 wires, one running from each LED back to the computer because the computer is controlling the power. It's sending power over those wires to the LEDs. Uh, you might be able to reduce that a little bit because you might observe that, you know, there's only, you know, in the 100 different configurations of the light bulb, there's only 23 banks of LEDs. These LEDs always, you know, these four LEDs always come on at the same time. Those three LEDs always come on. You might reduce it to 24 wires carrying power. That's still 24 wires. Now, if instead of carrying power from the central computer, instead of that, you stick a tiny little computer in the headlight. Now you need only two wires going into the head, headlight, one sending power to the headlight, and the second one sending messages to the computer in the headlight saying, activate this bank, activate that bank, uh, you know, and, and you know, you've, you've gone from 28 wires carrying power to one wire carrying power and a second wire, the CAN bus wire, carrying messages to the computer, and the computer figures out for itself where to send power within the, 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 the headlight. I mean, you folks investigated this. Can we talk about the solution? I mean, if the solution is not running more wires, um, you know, if the hack, you know, did not actually exploit a vulnerability, so there's, you know, there's nothing we can patch, how do you solve this? <laughs> that's, that's a good question too. So I, I'm, since since this story went to went crazy around the world i've had a lot of um, people suggesting their solutions and of course they they don't understand uh, the car industry very well so someone said well put a separate wire out to the headlights and then um uh, and then a gateway box that will uh, that will route them and then it will not allow non headlight messages um but the trouble is um you know even if you do really well and you get one of these little boxes added in which of course costs money uh, it, it might cost even as low as say 20 dollars but if you're making a million cars a year that's 20 million dollars of cars uh, you know, so over the lifetime, 
you could be you know, losing in money uh, expense if you designed it that way of of you know significant fractions of a billion dollars over the lifetime of the, the car model so you know that's that's why they didn't do that kind of thing because it's just just not cost effective um, but the CAN bus has to go everywhere. So, so the the kind of fundamental weakness is there's very strong security between your key and then um, uh, the smart key ECU, as they call it, um, to authenticate the key. So you can't spoof a key and, and so on, which used to be uh, a much more um, common hack attack. Um, but then the, the, the message from the smart uh, key receiver to say, I validated the key and now you can um, deactivate the mobilizer, that's unprotected and, and goes on the CAN bus. Um, so if you want to, to address that, it, it's possible, I guess, to do some kind of special wiring in, 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 in some very special circumstances, but that's not a great solution because it adds up cost and, and there's reliability problems every time you have a cable, like I said, ends of the cables have to be crimped and put into connectors and that's where they fall out and break. Uh, so, so it's not ideal. So, um, Fundamentally, the uh, the the way to, to to address this is through through encryption of the of the messages on on the CAN bus, um, at least the, the security ones. So instead of sending uh, a message to say to the engine management system to say deactivate the mobilizer, you send an encrypted message uh, with a key, uh, not a driver's key, but a, a cryptography key that's uh, that's unique to every car uh, and is programmed into. Uh, um, the wireless key receiver and is programmed into the engine management system and is programmed into the door controllers. And then when it says um, uh, the key has been validated, you know that it must only have come from uh, the, the, that, that ECU and it's not some criminal pu pushing fake messages in, in through the headline connector. Andrew, what you just mentioned there, uh, it reminds me of the uh, debate over uh, encrypting messages from PLCs and why we maybe do or don't do that. Yeah, I mean, in the you know in, in heavy industry, um, there's uh, people arguing about whether it makes sense to to encrypt messages, uh, you know, deep into uh, control networks. Um, the usual arguments against encryption are things like well you know to do strong encryption the you know the the tls style encryption um it takes cpu power and these cpus are underpowered and they can't do it um you know or you know the cpus are focused on real-time response and if you distract them with you know crypto calculations you're going to impair real-time response um you know, a, a second criticism is, hey, you know, we need to diagnose problems on these networks. And if we can't see the messages because they're encrypted, we can't figure out what the messages are. We can't diagnose the problems. Um, for the record, the standard answer there is don't encrypt the messages so you can't read them, but do in, and use what's called a, a cryptographic authentication code. So instead of a checksum saying, is the message authentic? Uh, did I lose any bits, you know, on, on the wire because of electromagnetic noise? You do a, a cryptographic authentication code, which is like a cryptographic checksum. Uh, it's longer than a regular checksum. And it not just detects missing bits because of electromagnetic noise, it also diagnoses whether someone is trying to forge a message. So you can still see the content of the message for diagnostic purposes, but the uh, you know the the authentication code is where the, the the bit of crypto happens. But there's still the question of you know is the CPU powerful enough to do modern crypto? But in my estimation, you know the the real problem with crypto in PLCs has to do with managing the keys, and that's actually my next question to Ken. So let's go back and, and listen in. In the beginning of the industrial security revolution, engineers were told to use IT security principles protect the information we were told. We knew this was a poor fit, but it was all we had. Today, the top security priority at industrial sites is safety. Don't kill anyone. Don't cause an environmental disaster. And the second priority is reliability. Do not shut down our factory or infrastructure. Today, safe and reliable operations use unhackable protections from cyber risks, not just cybersecurity. For a deeper look at the evolution of the revolution, we invite you to download Waterfall's report on the emerging consensus for industrial security engineering. You can access the report at the Waterfall website, waterfall-security.com engineering-consensus. 
or just go to the resources menu and click on white papers and ebooks. So that's, I mean, that's easy to say. It, it actually sounds a little bit manageable. I mean, keys, keys can be a real problem. I and mean, if you're a bank and you've got 12 million customers, how many, you know, keys have you got? On your website, you've got one really important key. That's it. Um, because you're authenticating to the customers. In an industrial control system, you know, if every programmable device has its own key, we're managing thousands of keys in like a power plant. It's a, it's a nightmare. Here, it sounds like you've got one key in the automobile, which sounds manageable, but you've got millions of automobiles, you know, driving the roads. Um, if you if you have a, a problem with a, a you know one of these electronic parts in an automobile, you've got to replace it. You've got to sync up the keys. You know what does key management look like? How big a problem is this, and and how's it been addressed? I think that's well. That's actually always the problem um, uh, that you've got to fix. Uh, there's, there's a saying that says uh, um, uh, crypt, cryptography uh, is a is a machine for turning any problem into a key management problem, um, uh, and that's really true. Is uh, uh, these uh, the electronics in the cars has got um, most most microcontrollers they're using in inside these uh, ECUs that they have um, hardware security modules that will do secure key storage and securely programming keys. So there's like a master key and you can program application keys in um, by proving that you know the master key. And then somewhere um, in the uh, the car makers infrastructure is a is a database of all the keys. Um, but obviously, you know, you can start to see some of the problems there. If uh, who has access to that database, um, you know, someone coming and cleaning the office can uh, open the uh, the drawer and get out a USB stick, and can, uh, and that's where the keys are stored. Well, obviously, that's a terrible problem. Uh, is the secure machine room, and who has access to that? And and if you leaked all of the keys to all of the cars um, in the world, um, and that got out, it would be a horrific problem. Uh, you, you can see these kinds of problems already happening today. Um, and then you've got uh, the other problem of, um, um, like you said, with spare parts. If you if you have a brand new spare part from uh, from the OEM, it's come through and it's in a cardboard box. It goes through to the, uh, the, the workshop guys. They've got to program that with the key um, uh, for, for the vehicle it's, it's going to be put into. And um, that means they have to have some kind of secure programming system that in, connects them to the infrastructure of the, the car manufacturer and uh, to, to the vehicle. And then typically over the CAN bus, we'll be sending in uh, key pro- reprogramming commands. Um, that's, that's traditionally not how uh, cars have been maintained, uh, not with live connections back to, to, to the vehicle uh, manufacturer's uh, own systems. And if you're, if you're building a car that uh, can be serviced by anybody uh, and spare parts put in from, you know, when you're out in the desert somewhere doing some kind of thing like that, you haven't got a live internet connection back to, to, to anywhere, uh, that's a big problem. Um, it's it's quite hard to solve these problems, um, and so I think in the end, uh, the easy bit is the uh, is the, what goes on inside the car uh, for protecting these messages, and the really hard bit is is managing those keys in a secure way that doesn't open up um, enormous risk for for compromising all of the vehicles uh, on the road. What about technicians? I mean, that, that's another class of insider. I mean, you know, in in the past, I thought you really you have to trust your mechanics. I mean, in the world of, of you know, uh, spy thriller espionage, the mechanic is touching the vehicle. If you can touch the vehicle, then to me, you can do anything to it. You can plant a bomb in it. You can sabotage the brakes. You can, you know, you have to be able to trust your mechanic. Is that another threat vector here? Yes. So, so yes, sort of. Obviously, yeah. The mechanic can do all kinds of things: cut your brake cables or brake pipes and stuff like that. So, so yeah. So there's a level of trust that's inherent. Um, but one of the problems, uh, certainly historically, has been uh, these tools are trusted to do things like um, create new clone keys when the customer comes in and complains they've lost a key, or um, uh, ref- ref- reflash the firmware in, in an ECU. Um, and what what we have seen in the past is uh, you know a spate of crimes uh, where somebody in the workshop has a criminal friend and lends them a laptop and they go out on the street and they've been um, breaking into cars and cloning keys and stuff. Um, so the car manufacturers over uh, over time have uh, started to close that uh, that loophole. Um, so now these tools have to authenticate themselves um, 
with with the uh, the uh, car manufacturer's own infrastructure. So uh, your your laptop will have a certain number of um, accesses to a vehicle, and it'll be pre-authorized for that, um, and then. Um, that will expire. So if, if the physical laptop's been stolen, then uh, eventually it, uh, it stops. Um, but there's also um, the keys. Because of the way the key management is done now for um, for, for cryptography, the uh, you can secure end-to-end from the car manufacturer's um, uh, infrastructure right through to the little tiny piece of silicon in the microcontroller in the ECU. And nothing in between can snoop on that or or, um, or or fake messages through that. So it's a it's a very nicely designed physical piece of silicon hardware, um, and that that was designed exactly that way so that uh, you can take out of the loop um, uh, these these workshop tools uh, to, to a certain extent, um, so that if the if the laptop is stolen, um, it can be shut off from accessing um, the the infrastructure database. So uh, I think to a certain extent that. That uh, attack surface, if you like, of of uh, the workshop is has or is being closed as these uh, as these uh, tools and infrastructure is being rolled out. Well, that's good news. Um, but you know, help me out here. I mean, these hardware security modules. I know them as as trusted platform modules (TPMs). I thought that TPMs were only available in in the high end, you know, Intel and and AMD and uh, you know, competing. CPUs, um, not in something small enough to fit into a headlight controller. How universally are these are these TPMs available? Okay, so so uh, the the uh, the automotive industry calls them um, hardware security modules (SHM), and they developed um, a standard for these called uh, secure hardware extensions (SHE). So it's an SHE HSM. Um, and uh, that's available on a lot of microcontrollers uh, that are used in automotive. So um, NXPs, uh, um, um, automotive parts have them, Renesas parts have them, Infineon's parts have them. Um, now, they're not available on the very, very lowest end, cheapest parts that you might use in some very, very small application. But for most um, most CPU intensive uh, ECUs, um, these are available um, on on, uh, on chip. Um, and they, um, I, I'm not sure exactly how the, the TPM concept is structured, but the way the HSM in, in, um, in automotive works is, is it has a secure key storage. So you can secure, you can store keys such that the, um, the software in the microcontroller can't read them out. Um, and it performs uh, a bunch of operations on those keys. So you can say, please make me an encrypted block please verify this uh, authentication code is uh, is correct um and it also handles things like secure boot so, so you can store in there the um the expected authentication code when you run all of the firmware uh, in the system through the uh, the hsm so then you can make it so that uh, no hacked firmware will will run you can only run authorized firmware that matches uh, the numbers that have been programmed into that HSM, and then it also includes this uh, this end to end key management, so that um, it has a, several types of keys inside the uh, hardware security module. So there's like a master key that should never normally be used for anything other than um, programming new keys in. So the application keys are all different to um, uh, to the master key, and the master key is used to authenticate messages to say, "Please change the uh, the application keys to to this." Um, now there is an issue when you have uh, that needs to participate in the encrypted communication a microcontroller that doesn't have a hardware security module, and so one of the things we have at Canvas Labs is a software emulation of a hardware security module. So it's a software hardware security module. Um, so you could use that in a something where you cared not too much about the uh, the security because um, the uh, TAC type is going to be um, uh, very limited. So th- these these hardware security modules, they're so secure that if you took um, the electronic control units out onto a bench top and you put uh, all kinds of uh, debug gear around them and stuff, it'd be very, 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 very difficult to extract the keys. Um, now, no, no thief by the roadside trying to plug into the headlights is ever going to be able to dig out the ECUs and put them on a bench top and stuff. So for, for, for this kind of can injection attack um, that, that we discovered, um, probably you don't even need a hardware security module. Probably just just encrypting the messages is enough um, because there's no realistic way that they can break into the unit um, uh, to, to, to decrypt the stuff. 
you've talked about taking it out and actually extracting the key. Um, in your estimation, you know, how robust are these keys? Because, you know, what we're walking around with in our pockets today in the form of a cell phone, the CPUs in those cell phones are more powerful than the supercomputers of 10 or 12 years ago. Um, you know, how how strong are these keys? Is it is it possible to just brute force them? No, no, it, they're, they're using um, AES um, with 128-bit uh, keys. Um, there's there's no practical way to brute forcing AES, uh, and, 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 and even if there was some some kind of brute force thing that would uh, after you know so many weeks of, of uh, server CPU time be able to do that, which in the future there might be, um, that's completely impractical for for um, the kind of theft attacks uh, on cars. Um, so so the application keys I think are are uh, in practice very um, um, very secure. Um, the the weakness I think is is uh, is at the infrastructure end of somehow the protection of that key database being um, being breached and then all the keys uh, splurge out. I think we had a recent attack with um, uh, where Intel managed to to leak the the private key used to to, to sign some of the uh, the firmware in their chips. So um, I think in the end, uh, attacking the algorithm directly is uh, is usually uh, not very effective. It's it's going around the sides um, into the into the weaknesses there. You know, I I study um, heavy industry, control systems in heavy industry, but I, I occasionally dabble in the automotive space. I remember five, six years ago, I read uh, a standard came across my desk for uh, over-the-air firmware updates in automobiles. It was a new standard for from the industry, and it talked about encryption from one end to the other. Encrypt this, encrypt that. Here's how you do the encryption. It's got to be this strong, and so on. Not a word about how the vendor, the automobile vendor, is protecting those keys. And I'm going, what? You know, I mean, we might trust GM. We might trust the vendor. Should we trust their website? You know, somebody breaks into GM, uh, you know, signs a dud piece of firmware, and now you've, you know, you, you push that firmware over the air into millions of vehicles that just stop because you know the firmware is all zeros but signed or something horrible like this um you know is anybody talking about you know to your example the the issue of stealing the keys from the vendor is anybody talking about how to secure those keys at the vendor i i don't see a, a lot of that um and, and i think this is a general problem in, in security is that we all have visibility of a piece of the problem but um very few people necessarily of course have uh, have expertise in every, every part of that um and unlike lots of computing where abstraction is used to um to simplify problems so that you abstract away uh, the complexity behind um some some black box uh in security it, it doesn't work that way very often uh, and that that's that tends to be a problem is, is is people have abstracted away from the problem of key management uh you know uh at Canis labs we're focused on the can bus and and, uh, and protecting that and then um yeah, somebody else has to worry about another part of the problem, and you you see this in standards quite a lot, where they just say blah 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 is out of scope, um, because sometimes because it's it's too prescriptive to solve it in that standard, so it's out of scope. So the the the, the baton is passed to somebody else to pick it up, and and uh, taking that kind of whole view um, w with the necessary level of details that you know goes below you know tick problem solved as well. Actually, is it really is 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 this? And it's 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 those. It's those gaps um, that that I think is where where lots of the, um, the the real vulnerabilities lie. Like I say, attacking an algorithm head on is uh, is is rarely going to solve uh, anything. But attacking those gaps of like, well, this this thing was handed on to that person because it came from this thing here, and this system picks up something, trusts it, but actually shouldn't because this tiny, tiny, tiny thing was uh, overlooked. And you see this all the time in vulnerabilities. Is is that one little tiny particular thing? I think we had one of the uh, a Wi-Fi uh, protocol exploit recently, where one particular tiny obscure part of the protocol didn't specify that certain things should 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 have uh, encryption. Um, and I think that's that's the biggest uh, issue. Um, I'm not sure how to solve that though. Andrew, it feels like we're uh, drifting into the technical here. Is there an example you could give to sort of anchor this conversation? Yeah, sure. So you know the the. The question I asked was about uh, a standard I saw a handful of years ago uh, talking about how automobiles communicate 
in real time over the cell network with manufacturers. And the, the standard had to do with firmware updates. So sending new software into you know some of the various hundred controllers inside the vehicle. Uh, the attack scenario that I worried about is, you know, there's a war in the Ukraine. You know, Russia's invaded the Ukraine. Let's say the Russians get it into their head. You know, they're a nation state. They've got money. They've got talent. They can launch, you know, essentially arbitrarily uh, complex and sophisticated attacks. Let's say they get it into their head to uh, cripple the transportation infrastructure in uh, in in the United States because of, you know, the United States uh, support for the Ukraine. How would they do that? They could break into one of the car manufacturers, uh, you know, pick your, your favorite uh, car manufacturer that has a lot of vehicles in the United States. And if they're able to steal the, the keys, if they're able to break into the part of the manufacturer's infrastructure that creates new firmware, they could create a firmware of all zeros so that, you know, when the CPU reboots, it uh, it's dead. Um, they could sign that firmware with the stolen keys. They could push that firmware over the cell network into the vehicles and cripple, you know, all of the vehicles that have that sort of generation of firmware from that manufacturer. Millions of vehicles. These might be trucks. They might be cars. They might be anything. And, and you know, do it when the vehicle's GPS, when the, the, the you know, the... the the controller that they've compromised senses that it's in the continental United States. You know, this is the kind of really nasty attack that I worry about. And Ken's answer was, yeah, that's a piece of the puzzle that we're not really talking about. He's an expert on what happens inside the vehicle, the CAN bus. The standard I mentioned was a standard for communicating between the vehicle and the vendor. Uh, and his answer was, yeah, that's that's a different piece of the puzzle. What happens with keys inside the head of the vendor, inside the development systems of the vendor, is a different part of the problem as well. And he's saying there's almost nobody in the world who understands the big picture. And there's probably gaps in there that need to be addressed. So that's the bad news. But, you know, we're drifting out of both Ken's sweet spot expertise-wise and mine. So, you know... With that sort of example to get you worried, we, maybe we need you know another expert on in in uh, another episode. But you know, let's let's go back to Ken and talk about what's happening inside the vehicle. It sounds like there's good news and bad. We understand the problem. There's technology out there that can solve a lot of the problem. What's the status of this? I mean, for those of us who would like to avoid having our vehicles stolen, um, you know, what what how. How high should we should we hope for this problem, you know, being solved either in new vehicles coming in the future or you know retrofits for for our existing vehicles? Yeah, that's that's a that's probably the the the, the key question here. Um, so so even if you solve everything in the future, there are many many vehicles on the road today, um, and if they can be um, reprogrammed over the air so that they all roll to a halt at the same time on all the roads, um, this is kind of neutron bomb effect of destroying infrastructure um so uh so so today there are some standards uh, around that are being deployed um so uh so one of them is um uh, is called secure onboard uh, communication um and this doesn't do encryption but it does add authentication um because encryption is hiding the payload and authentication is is validating it that it, it came from the right place so the, they're doing the important part uh, uh first is that these um these messages are being validated um and that's being rolled out um cars are come there are cars on the road that are using this new um SecoC um standard for for encryption of messages um and uh most cars in the future i think are going to be using something like that or or very similar um so I think that part of it is probably uh, fixed. Uh, and as I said, uh, hardware security modules have been in silicon for a while now, and um, you know, this, the Seco seat uses um, uses that. So I think I think on the target end that's okay. Um, and then um, uh, the infrastructure end. Uh, the, the problem is I don't know very much about the infrastructure end because I'm focused on the uh, the embedded software and electronics uh, end of things. Um, but we know how to manage keys uh, to to. Uh, to a certain extent, obviously, some very embarrassing um, uh, exceptions are making the news. So i i find it I find it very difficult to understand uh, just how risky um, and uh, and vulnerable um, 
the the infrastructure end uh, is going to be. Um, I mean, I'm not hopeful generally about IT security in this this space because we've seen so many of these uh, these things, and these are just the ones we we know about uh, with key, key leaks. Um, and and what's different between this and you know your your login was compromised type thing is there this is hardware that that physically moves in the real world and has uh, has very severe consequences uh, if uh, if it's been attacked, um, and particularly if you can uh, do a mass attack where you can. As, as you said, uh, just uh, brick ECUs in, uh, in in millions of cars at the same time um, because of some tiny uh, tiny uh, detail that was overlooked in the infrastructure end. So that that's where I I'm most worried about all of this. It's less to do with the uh, the target end um, because thieves stealing your cars is um, is not scalable. You know, you'd have to have a million thieves all, all coordinated to try and uh, uh, break the system. Um, the, the road network. Um, so in, uh, your other question about what uh, what's going to happen to cars on the roads today that are vulnerable to being stolen, um, that's probably the question that most owners have uh, at the front of their minds. Um, um, I mean, I've seen, seen suggestions that you should use steering wheel locks like it's 1999 again, um, which I don't like very much. Uh, we ought to be able to have nice things without them being stolen. Um, so that that's you know, these, these physical kind of things, and there are immobilizers, um, third party immobilizers. Um, I I haven't seen immobilizers that are the, that uh, that the manufacturer approves of, um, because if you start jamming things into the electronics of your car, you can cause all sorts of problems um, with that. And then I have seen some immobilizers that uh, are smart immobilizers that are connected to the internet through. Um, through 3G modems and 4G modems and things. Um, and then th- you're now relying on the uh, third party's uh, uh, security measures to stop people getting into your vehicle remotely. So you can end up um, causing a bigger problem than, than you fix with that. Uh, so, so the real solution is the the, um, the OEMs need to take something like our software hardware security module for for things that were made before these, these chips existed, uh, put that in place, um, and then issue a firmware update. Um, now that is not like... Uh, an easy thing either um, when you push out firmware say into an engine management system and it's got to have uh, you know our, our software in there for example um, everything has to be retested um, you know these are critical pieces of software you don't just uh, make a change to the code compile it and then uh, and then send it out to all the workshops to be burned into all the cars uh, around the world that's that's uh, not how it's done so um, we wouldn't ex- we won't expect a, a, a software update to be very quick um, because of Responsible car makers take a long time to revalidate all their software, but uh, in theory, it should be possible. And um, I'm, I'm really hoping that uh, this can be retrofitted to, to existing vehicles. You know, I thought this is a, a fun topic, but the way that Ken is putting it there sounds rather grim. Yeah, well, I asked I asked Ken a hard question. Um, you know, it's the kind of pivoting attack, uh, you know, bad guys taking over a cloud service, using the compromised cloud service to get into power plants, to get into railway switching systems that have, you know, industrial internet connections. This is the kind of question that I face with my customers in heavy industry all the time. And I thought it was probably relevant to this industry. But, um, you know, Ken's answer basically was, yeah, that sounds worrying. Uh, but he's an expert on what happens inside the vehicle. You know, I study what happens in other industries. Neither of us is really qualified to comment on whether this is a realistic attack in this industry or whether there's mechanisms in place that we're not aware of to deal with these risks. Um, so, you know, to me, it's it's uh, it's an opportunity to get someone from the manufacturers uh, on the, on the show and maybe maybe speak to that. Yeah, I'm actually surprised that um, I can't recall off the top of my head anybody from the manufacturing side of the automobile industry that we've had on in recent history. We may have had a guest um, many episodes ago, but yeah, it's it's uh, not an industry we've we've dived deep into, and I would welcome an opportunity to do that. You know, we're past a hundred episodes now. Bluntly, when we started this podcast, you know, I had my own sort of little specialization of, of you know, heavy industry, power industry, rail switching. Um, and I thought naively that, you know, that was most of what there was to talk about. And, you know, it's been 100 episodes. I've learned stuff in every episode. The, the elephant that is industrial security is, uh, is bigger than I thought. A word of clarification on the software update. If you 
push out a software update that uh, you know does this authentication, you would have to hit every device in the vehicle at the same time, would you not? Or or could you do a partial update and hit you know ninety percent of them? And if you miss ten percent of the CPUs, it'll still work. But would you know? A, it, it it might work. Would it be effective? That that's a very good question. Is, is uh, for for anti theft? Um, it's a very very small. Uh, for example, in the Toyota Rav Four, you would need to update three ECUs: the the, the doors, uh, the key, um, uh, radio key receiver, uh, and the engine management system, or, or possibly instead the gateway that relays the message onto the uh, engine management system. So that would be three ECUs. They'd all have to be updated together. Um, um, because otherwise they need to be running on the same versions that would that had that, and it needs to tap into the uh, the key management infrastructure, um, or else some very lightweight version of key management that would uh, be good enough just just to stop th- uh, thieves. Um, so, but the, the the car manufacturers, as I said, they're already rolling out um, some some of these more advanced things that already have the the, uh, the the key management infrastructure as part of that solution. So, I think you could probably just um, connect up to that that key management infrastructure and then make a software update that would go to three three ECUs uh, in, in the uh, Toyota RAV4 case. Um, in general, this this is, of course, a, a problem in general of uh, software updates um, when you're updating a distributed real-time control system. If you put firmware um, into some of the ECUs and not into some of the others, um, and then something on the network has changed to add a message or to add some content or change the meaning of content, um, it's a complete mess um, and and updating all the firmware so that it all is all updated or none of it is updated um, is actually a real problem. And this is another reason why uh, manufacturers have, have kind of been reticent about over the air updates is because uh, there's a lot of ways it can go wrong, horribly wrong. Um, and so they're very, very cautious because the consequences of it going horribly wrong at the same time everywhere are potentially enough to to, to sink a company. Um, if you think about um, uh, a piece of firmware that's gone in that uh, has a um, a date or a mileage related bug uh, that somehow causes the um, over the air flash programming to fail and to get triggered and erase the flash firmware but not have new firmware, then um, you'll find that cars are just rolling to a halt as. Uh, with, with like broken engine management systems all over the world, all at the same time, um, you know, it's a very serious problem. So, if you start to do a risk analysis of, of over-the-air updates, it's it's not an easy thing to to fix with without risk. I mean, obviously, if you don't care about risk and you just want to do things for publicity or whatever, then you just go ahead and do it and, and see what happens. Um, but responsible uh, manufacturers uh, really are very concerned about how to do over-the-air updates very carefully. You'll see that uh, there was a story went round. Um, everyone was laughing. Uh, I think it was BMW uh, wouldn't do a, a, a over-the-air software update um, without the car being parked um, on the flat. If it was parked on an incline, the software update refused to work. And everyone thought this was very funny. But actually, it's a sign that um, of just how seriously they're taking it. When you're doing a software update, the firmware update process um, uh, might go wrong kind of catastrophically crazy realm because there was a bug and it might um, start randomly writing to io ports and one of those io ports might be the um the parking brake release so uh, either you have to engineer the entire firmware update process to a safety critical level or you have to uh, make sure the car is in a safe state before you start that process and in a safe state means not parked on a hill where if the software went wrong the car would roll down the hill um so that's just one example i think of um people that take it very seriously um, and have done their risk analysis. Uh, so it's not really anything to be laughed at, although I can see it is, is amusing. Can you sum up for us though? What, what should we take away? What's the sort of, what's the big picture here? Uh, I think the, the, the real thing I want, I wanted to get across is that uh, uh, the car industry isn't stupid, isn't full of dumb people making dumb decisions. Um, all these decisions are, are made for uh, very good and practical reasons. And if you think a problem is easy, then probably you don't know the constraints. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, these things all, all are, are being put in place uh, with, a, with a measured level of risk, knowing what could happen if, if things go wrong. Um, so I, I think that's the, that's the big takeaway is that uh, um, it, it's a very hard and difficult problem they're trying to solve. 
If people want to understand uh, these constraints more and understand the automotive uh, industry, I have uh, I write a blog. Uh, so I recently posted a, a, um, about how over-the-air software updates work um, and uh, the particular problems of the car industry, so if you want to learn about that, um, and how CAN bus uh, works and the constraints that uh, it has to, to, to meet uh, are very, very, very different to, to what people are used to in computers and servers and Ethernet switches and stuff. So, so uh, have a look at my blog site, um, if you want to find out more about the, the car industry and uh, you can contact me, say, on uh, on LinkedIn very easily if you want, or you could visit the uh, Canis Labs uh, website at canislabs.com and have a look at uh, our encryption software. Andrew, that was your interview with Ken Tyndall. Uh, to take us out here, I've got two questions for you. Number one, how much do I have to worry about my car being cyber stolen? And number two, how much do I have to worry about everybody's in general? Well, I heard uh, sort of good news and bad news on that front. Uh, the The good news is that, uh, you know, Ken is reporting that in his experience, manufacturers are very cautious about updating firmware in vehicles because of safety concerns. Um, you know, and... Uh, you know, in terms of sort of sort of mass firmware updates, malicious firmware updates, you know, hopefully the uh, the vendors are just as concerned about controlling access to their keys, so that you know malicious actors can't use the firmware update uh, mechanism against us. That that whole process is so safety critical that you know hopefully they've they've got that under control. But we would need a sort of a guest from the manufacturer to uh, explain that part of the world to us. Um, the bad news sounds like in the short term, um, the, the manufacturers, because it takes so long and it's so difficult to, you know, prove the safety of these, these firmware versions, they might be reluctant to issue, uh, a short-term software update to try and solve, you know, try and insert some of the, the, the crypto, even on a software level, um, to deal with this theft problem. You know, it might be that by the time they get that whole business tested and ready to roll out, it's two years from now. And well, bluntly, the thieves aren't stealing these cars anymore that, that are going to be updated. And the new cars are coming out with the, the hardware authentication built in. So, um, you know, maybe people with new cars today worried about theft need to use the immobilizer for a year or two. And, you know, then by then, hopefully we've, we've got the problem solved. All right. Well, thanks to Ken Tyndall for speaking with you, Andrew. And Andrew, as always, thank you for speaking with me. It's always a pleasure. Thank you, Nate. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody out there listening.